This is a Black Talk Radio News report from behind the enemy lines of USAE. We are joined by Baltimore-based criminal justice reform advocate and abolitionist Christopher Irvin. Mr. Irvin will speak to us about recent legislative moves in the Maryland legislature to restore the voting rights of ex-prisoners as soon as they are released from prison. The debate between the Democratic-led legislature and the Republican Party center around constitutional rights. Republicans want to keep punishing ex-prisoners past their court-mandated sentences, and Democrats said that taxation without representation was a central complaint American colonists had against the British Crown. Thank you for joining us on Black Talk Radio, Mr. Christopher Irvin. Thanks for having me, Scott. It is on a, I guess we could say, a, a, a good occasion, usually when we talk to uh people on our network and we reach out to them for interviews it's usually about a problem and, and not about a solution but that isn't the case on our occasions to speak with you today mr Irvin. uh we we know that uh the maryland legislature it took a lot of doing but they were able to override the governor's veto of this legislation that will restore felony uh voting rights as they are they are known um, I specifically remember you coming on our program and talking to us about, you know, a, a multitude of issues. But one of the things you were working on personally uh, was to get the voting rights of felons uh, restored, among other things. That's right. Um, we've been working on this for a while. And the, the bill was sponsored by Delegate Corey McCray. And what it is is a bill that currently in the state of Maryland, when people are, are, re are released from incarceration, or even if they go into court and uh, they've taken a plea, if they are still on parole and or probation, they cannot vote. That is currently the law. And what the bill said was that these people should be able to vote as soon as they um, are released from prison or if they receive a plea, they should be able to vote immediately. The premise being that they still have to work. And if you can be taxed, you should be able to vote for your representation. And so today, what happened in the uh, House of Delegates is that in the House of Delegates, they received the number of votes needed to overturn the governor's veto. Now, unfortunately, it still has to go to the Senate side. Maryland uh, legislature is made up of the House and the Senate. The House of Delegates, we got the votes needed today to overturn the vote, but it now has to go to the Senate side. So we're, we're a little more than halfway home. And what are the number of votes needed in the Senate side in order to uh, fully override the governor's veto? I actually don't have the specific number of votes needed now, but the good thing is it's, it's substantially less than the House. The House of Delegates is somewhere around 147, I believe. The Senate is much less, but I, I, I don't have an accurate count for you right now. What about the support? Have have uh, the have you or the people that are working on this issue found out if the support exists to pass this legislation or to override the veto in, in the Senate? Does anyone expect to uh, have the votes needed there? We we do expect to have the votes. It's it's based on a, a majority vote in the uh, Senate as well as the House is made up of majority Democrats. Today's uh, vote in the House went straight down party line. And uh, we expect that that's what will happen on the Senate side. And even if that happens there, we, sh we should be all right. We should have it. What has been some of the reasoning uh, from the Republican opposition and the governor for not restoring the constitutional voting rights of ex-prisoners? Well, it's funny you say that. There's a Senator uh, Edward Riley from Anne Arundel County in Maryland, a Republican senator who uh, his, in his statement, he said that uh, we didn't want rapists to get out early and to be able to vote. Um, this vote has nothing to do with anyone being released early. It has nothing to do with um, any particular crimes. I, I, I mean, it was the most um, it was the most smoke filled statement to try and um, incite people to want to vote against the bill. The bill is simply, again, if you um, once you're released or, or as long as you're on the outside and you can be taxed, you have you should have the right to vote. I think there was a, a big deal in Boston about that sometime back in the 1700s um, about taxation without representation. And that's often celebrated in this country as one of its founding principles. And yet now we, uh, we, we seem to want to forget all of that. And I think that's primarily based on who it predominantly affects. Um, we know that 
mass incarceration predominantly affects people of color and black people in particular. And so this is why some of the people that are opposing it would, would, would use the, you know, the go-to stories, the, the, the fears of mass murderers and robbers and rapists being uh, released um, and not addressing the fact that the majority of people um, currently incarcerated for nonviolent crimes. I don't if, we, know. if we want to be serious about reentry, we should be serious about inclusivity. People should be able to participate in the communities that they go back to. I mean, doesn't this also speak to constitutional rights um, in terms of is it cruel and unusual punishment to impose what we see often in the case of ex-prisoners, sometimes lifetime punishment that go beyond the court mandated sentences? Absolutely. Constant, uh, cruel and unusual punishment. But it, let's, let's go back to these amendments. And, you know, in, in this party of, of Republicans, as it, as it were, they, they're staunchly in favor of the Second Amendment, which is fine. It's a constitutional right. But then they seem to want to forget the other amendments. When we talk about the 13th and its exception, which you are well aware of, um, except where the party shall have been duly convicted. Let's skip two amendments away and look at the 15th. The 15th Amendment guarantees the right to vote regardless of race, color, or condition of prior servitude. Those, that language is right there in plain English. And so when, so anyone who would stand against this, uh, this bill is going, is, is wanting to stand against the constitutional amendment. And that's fine. But when they want to stand on other constitutional amendments, you can't have it both ways. If you're for the rights of citizens, then be for all of them, and not for some of them, depending on who it affects most. Now, to that point about who it affects most, and we do know the disproportionate rate at which, let's say, black people and non-white people in general are targeted by the system, are therefore more affected by uh, the loss of constitutional rights more than others. But on the Republican side, this seems to be a national strategy. I don't know if you are aware of a story that came out of Florida where you had a member of the Republican Party in Florida talk about uh, uh, um, changing the districts and putting more of the prisons in the so-called black district, gerrymandering, so that these primarily black districts will be filled with non-voting uh, black people who are in those prisons and that it ha was a, mm -hmm. a strategy that they laid out. And so do you see this being something that's playing out across the nation and not just there in Maryland in terms of furthering, furthering to disenfranchise uh, the African-American voter? Well, I would suggest to you that that's been a strategy of that party all along. Um, here in the state of Maryland, where most of the um, larger jails are out in um, more rural areas, we know that different states and, and different areas have been counting their prisoners in the population of of the, of the cities that the jails are in, as opposed to the cities that the uh, the, the people incarcerated come from. And so last uh, legislative session, I was able to sit in a confirmation hearing uh, for someone related to public safety, and a senator spoke up. And the, the, the person who was being confirmed said he is a, yes, he's going to be confirmed to this position of public safety overseeing um, prisons and everything else. But he believes that we, are, we have not been conducting ourselves in, in a smart way, that um, there are some things that he would like to look at as far as reform. And a particular senator spoke up. He said that he was from Somerset County here in Maryland. And that's where um, ECI, uh, one of the prisons, is located. And he said, well, I would like for you to take a hard look at that statement that you made about reform. I hope that you're not suggesting closing a prison because that's kind of the basis of economics in my particular, in that particular city. I hope you're not talking about people losing their jobs. Now, I was incredulous when he said this, and I'm looking around the room and everybody else, even people of his party, were kind of looking at each other like, did he just say that out loud? When jobs and economics are more important than people's lives, uh, um, who may be locked up, um, you know, incarcerated um, improperly, maybe shouldn't be there at all. This is, again, a premise of that party. Now, to their credit, also, there are people who around the country of that party who, are, who have begun to come around. But I think we need to be very honest um, in, in these discussions and very pointed when, when we speak to different issues. I'm, I have no problem pointing a finger at people or, or outing people who would talk like that or act like that as if, the economics of a job are more important than a person who possibly shouldn't even be incarcerated. 
Is there anything in closing that you would like to leave with the listeners? Um, I'll tell you, we had a uh, forum last Saturday on the consequences, the collateral consequences of conviction. Um, and what that is, is uh, all of these kinds of issues, the way people are punished even beyond the completion of their sentence. And what I need people to understand is that if you want things done differently, you have to participate. No one should be more well-versed on your situation than you. No one can do more to change your situation than you. We have to get involved. And if that you is not you in particular, if it's a loved one, a friend, or someone, else, we have to be involved. No one's voices should be louder than ours in this fight. If we want different, we have to do different. Uh, one last question. One last question. Uh, are you still running, uh, planning to run for Baltimore City Council? And um, are you still exploring that, or have you made a decision? Oh, the decision is made, and I'm in the midst of a campaign now. It's, it's, it's a struggle because I live in a district that's been dominated by one way of doing things. Um, it, it's, been, it's a district that is catered to a minority of the population and has allowed the majority of the population to languish in, in a state of, of just unacceptable condition. Um, the, the incumbent has decided to not run again, and it's wide open. But with that, they want to replace the incumbent with someone just like the incumbent. Um, incumbent was the longest serving elected person in the history of the state of Maryland, had the city council seat since 1977. And so with that, if any of your listeners um, feel as though this is an effort they like to support, feel free to go to my at www.irvin for city council. That's E-R-V as in Victor, E-R-V-I-N for city council.com. And uh, see how you can support. We'd love all of the help people offer, even if it's just to go there and, you know, leave a little message saying, go, <laughs> go, Irvin, go. Um, any support is helpful. Thank you for speaking with us today, Mr. Christopher Irvin. Thank you, Scotty Reed.